right. So anyone in here at QA? No? All right, I'm alone. Cool. <laughs> so uh, just some quick details about myself. Uh, as he said, Chelsea Squanda. Uh, I have over 12 years of experience doing QA across a variety of things. I've worked um, in web applications. I've tested video game consoles, tested mobile, all sorts of fun stuff. Um, I'm on the Chippy Slack if you want to contact me there, or you can reach me at my email right there as well. Uh, so why are we here mainly more importantly why am i here talking about this um as kind of hinted before the relationship between qa and devs tends to be a little antagonistic and i would like to see that change because i have worked with groups where the dev and qa were very integrated talked to each other regularly and what we released was of a much higher quality than in situations where i didn't so what we'll be going through is some current issues that are facing QA. Uh, we'll look at some real world examples where either QA failed or the flow was not trusted and devs kind of went around. Um, and then I'll finish up with some suggestions for non-QA to take out into the world with them and I'll answer any questions you might have. So current issues. First off, devs. You should be testing your code. And this does mean writing unit tests. Again, for those in the back, write unit tests. 100% coverage is something to strive for. The reason is this is a very easy way for you to test your own work before you hand it off. If you hand us something that is broken because you did something silly, that wastes time when we have to send it back to you. So write your fucking unit tests. <laughs> All right. So devs is QA. Now, I see run across two flavors of this. There's devs who are primarily focusing on testing their own work. And then there's devs who take turns being the team's QA. Now, I have to ask you, if you're doing something you don't want to do, do you go do a good job of it? Do you like get in the corners? Do you tick all the boxes? No, you don't. You just kind of do it to what you feel is good and you call it done. And that's kind of the big problem with devs is QA because you're running into blind spots because you're testing your own code. Because I will admit, I do this too, where it's like, I wrote it. It's good. It's not wrong, but it can be wrong. Um, and also, you're going to get variable quality. You're going to run into people who are really good. They're going to hit all the corners. They're going to tick all the boxes. But on the same team, you might get someone who's just like, all right, we're good. And that's not good. All right, so I'm going to make some friends in this room right now. I hate generative AI. I hope it dies a slow, painful death. <laughs> Let's move on. So the general concerns that are not QA focused is often a lot of these are trained illegally, which is a really big issue. People's content, the things that they have created are being stolen and used to make stuff for you. That's not good. They are inherently biased. They are biased towards what you put in. So if you put in stuff, but don't, so if you put in stuff that's biased towards A, but you don't really do anything for B, <coughs> that, that machine learning system is going to be primarily biased towards A. We also have hallucinations where it'll just make shit up, which is just what you want when you're doing QA. And also it's expensive and odds are it's only going to get more expensive in the future. So we'll switch over to some QA specific concerns. So really one of the big ones is black box decision-making. With the person, you can go up to them and be like, okay, so how did you get from start to finish? And they can be like, okay, so in past releases, you know, I've noticed we've been running into this issue with performance. So this time I made sure to like really dig in and I caught this in one of the logs and so I flagged it. With an AI, it's just like, I just did it. I just did it. And you, there's really no guarantee that it will follow that same pattern and logic each time you run it which is bad. Also, you cannot update knowledge in real time. Going back to how it's trained, it only knows what it's been trained. So if like today you come in and 
it only knows, let's say English, and you need it to understand German, you're going to need to train it to understand German. Uh, so I'm sure most people in the room have heard of software as a service. Have you heard of QA as a service? Have you heard of companies like Amber, any of that? Okay. So they are available, they're growing in popularity, uh, mainly because places don't want to house and pay for their own QA. But this is a problem. As someone who's recently worked with Amber, these are the things that I personally witnessed. First off, they're not integrated with the rest of the development team. So we were on central time, they were over in Europe, which meant when we were awake, they were sleeping. So we would come in, see what they did, respond to the tickets, and then send them back and be like, fingers crossed they get back to us tomorrow. This is lost time. This is not what we want in software development. Also, you may only be limited to sharing certain pieces of information with them, especially when you get into things like IP, cybersecurity, stuff like that. You may not be able to give them all the information so they won't have all the information when they're testing. The other thing is, this is a separate group with its own priorities. Let's say Chippy were to hire them to do QA for their website. What do you think would happen if Google came in and like, we want to buy up your whole shop because we need to test this and get this thing out the door? They're going to drop you or they're going to give you one, maybe two people to get you through. So there's no guarantee you're going to get the service that you want. Also, and most importantly, often these poor people are overworked and underpaid. If you go to any glass door for these places, that is the biggest ding. These people are overworked and underpaid. That is not nice. So now we're going to talk about some real world examples of QA failure. But everyone in the room is going to know what the first one is. Anyone want to take a guess? Striker. Yes. <laughs> so, this is the official analysis that they put out in the short search for this presentation. Wow. I wasn't able to find a like third party one. So if anyone knows of one, please give it to me so I can <coughs> add it to this. But we'll just go off of what they have here because it points out their failure on multiple fronts. So the first off, they only tested happy paths and valid data. Now, that's good for a first pass, but this is something that's going out and it's handling that. It's, it, you can't just do happy paths because the world isn't perfect. It's gonna run into things that doesn't understand. It's gonna run into issues. And I'm not gonna lie, when I saw the piece of code that supposedly called, caused this, that was beaten out of me within two months of learning C++ myself. And you know what probably would have caught that? A unit test. <laughs> so, but it's not just CrowdStrike's fault because, you know, maybe their QA only had time to test the happy paths and the valid data. And we'll talk later why that is not something production should allow, um, producers, I'm sorry, should allow. But let's go to Microsoft. Um, anyone here worked in video games? Yeah. So the thing about Microsoft is there are three layers of the system. There's production. So that like if you were to pull out an Xbox or a PlayStation or whatever, what you are accessing is the production level. Underneath that is certification. This is where things go for Microsoft to test them before they're allowed in production. Under that is your own personal development area. So Microsoft will not allow a video game to release to update their game if it does not pass certification, which really makes me wonder what they were doing with software that was kernel level and they didn't fucking test it properly. And also, the other one, no staggered releases. So instead of saying the computers in this room getting the update, failing and then they only had to fix the, compu the, the computers in this building they released it to everybody so they had to fix all of the computers stagger releases please so the next one uh, these are some personal experiences i've gone through so going back to uh, world of tanks uh as i explained we test releases on multiple environments we have the dev and stable dev and stable down here we have the platform verification right here. And then we have closed tests and production up here. 
So I tested this release. It's our account invoicing tool and it worked. It worked on all of those. It worked when we um, updated everything in production. Stop working the next day. I get a call from DevOps. They're like, what is going on? Have you seen this? I'm like, oh, this is what happens when you when this file gets changed to this value because it was something I had noticed during testing. He's like, but that shouldn't be the case. Like, no one's changed this. I'm like, someone changed it. So we went in and someone had changed it. And because we did not have unique logins, we did not know who did it. Super fun. <laughs> The next one, I don't know, because it's a Chicago uh, based uh, company. I don't know if anyone knows Vail System, but I worked there for a short period and their QA department was just dis disgustingly underdeveloped. <laughs> there were no written test cases. The automation was unintuitive, undocumented and not peer reviewed. They had it split across multiple repos for no discernible reason. If you wanted to see what it was doing, you actually had to go into the code itself and look. It, it's not something that I would recommend you ever letting get to that level. It was bad. Oh. All right, so now we're to suggestions. And I'm going to do it one more time. Write unit tests, please and thank you. <laughs> the other thing is document everything. If you, if the developers don't know what went into the release, no one knows. So this includes features, fixes, what areas of the code base were touched. A good example would be if you were updating account invoicing, but you needed to tweak the login system a little bit to make it work. Let the testers know, put it in the ticket, because otherwise they're going to look at, oh, we changed account invoicing. They're not going to intuit, oh, we also need to test plugins. The other thing is detailed release notes. This kind of goes into, excuse me, kind of goes into that because that's something we can fall back on if things go wrong. And also to go back to this personal experience, make sure your test cases are written down. It can be in Confluence, it can be in Test Rail, it can be in any one of the many services that are out there that do this. Just make sure it's written down, uh, set up steps, uh, test steps with expected results and then clean up. So everybody, so if say I were testing a big release and I got hit by a bus on my way home, today, <coughs> would the release be fucked? Not if you've documented everything. <laughs> the other thing is build in time to test. So I don't work at CrowdStrike. No. I don't know anybody who does, but I would bet that this kind of played into what happened here is that the devs did not meet their coding deadline and so they just kept pushing and compressing QA time until it was practically non-existent. I have run into producers who do this and it's really fucking annoying because I tell them we need three full weeks to properly test this. If you want to cut that down to two, this is what we're cutting. And then they get like, but but you can get all that done in two weeks, right? No, three full weeks. The other thing is test across multiple environments in different states. This, not only do you get a feel of how it will run in different places, but it helps make sure everything is documented. So say you push something to dev environment and it works, but then you go to stable and then something's wrong. Well, then you realize, oh, I forgot to document this configuration value. Let's update that in the notes. The other thing is unique sign-ins. Everybody should have their own sign-ins and this includes <laughs> any testing account. Test accounts should have bare minimum permissions. You don't want somebody going in and having fun with your systems under the guise of a QA account. The other thing is stand by their Q your QA. They are best place to know if what you want to release is in a releasable state because they're testing it, they're using it, they're playing with it. Listen to them, please. Questions? Yes, sir. Oh, do you want the microphone? Is it this one? Yeah, let me run these So say you have all your unit tests, your end-to-end -end, end -end test integration tests, you know, the tests like all these automated tests that do, you know, a kind of uh, comprehensive suite tests. What does or where does the like the human interaction kind of 
where do you draw the line between automated testing and then like having humans test? Like, uh, so I kind of draw the line between what are humans good at and what are computers good at? Computers are really good at comparing values or, you know, checking things that don't really require a human eye. Human eye is good for like, does this look right? Does this feel right? Or in the case of some things where it's like, you have to make a judgment call. It's going to be a huge pain in the ass to automate it, or you could take five minutes every release and just do it manually. So that's kind of how I look at what should be automated and what should be manual. Uh, any other questions? Oh, sorry, uh, you have the remote. What would be an example of like a workflow or a setup where the QA team worked well with the devs? Mm -hmm. And what would be an example where it did not? So I would say, well, QA should be really in any like, weekly meetings you have for a project, I wouldn't necessarily say they need to be there for like when devs are figuring out like what is the, what's the word I'm looking for, like the architecture, <coughs> like deciding on what the, the final product is going to look like, but when they're done, <coughs> QA should be brought in so that they can make sure that things are testable. A uh, good example, going back to Wargaming, uh, one of the devs there didn't really involve QA until the last minute. And then we discovered to our great dismay that this could only be tested on a production level environment. So we either had to test it live or we had to test it in CT. We couldn't test it down here. And that made testing awful. It missed its release date by quite a bit. And that's bad. But if you have QA in from the beginning, they can point things out like, can this be tested outside of a production environment? Do you want it to be able to test it outside of an environment? Because it may not even necessarily be things like that. You know, devs may not, it, you could just be blind to something. I do it myself or I'm just like, oh shit, I didn't think of that. Or, oh, I didn't know that interacted that way. So just really it comes down to having QA in so they can give another perspective. Whereas if you just leave them like on their own little island until you need them, they're not going to be there to like point things out or have important context. So, yeah. Thank you. I'm sorry, does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yes. So what kind of language would you maybe use? As a developer, I, of course, don't want to make QA mad. That's a good argument. But <laughs> oftentimes we're not answering to QA, we're answering to management. So like, do you have any keywords magic phrases to use with management that say give us more time because oftentimes it's like timelines pushed for try to fit in, in as many features as you can we don't have time for qa we don't have time for testing you don't have time to do write the tests do you have any language you'd suggest about telling management like hey we do need the time we do need the tests so the way i try to orient it is i make it a decision that they have to sign off on. So I'll bring it back to that example I gave earlier of the producer in the situation where he wanted to test something in two weeks or less that took three. And I told him like, okay, this is what you're going to get. And this is what we're axing. You need to sign off on it. Yep. And immediately, as soon as he had to put his name on that line, he's like, oh, I don't want to do that. You take all the time you need. So in my experience, that's what works best is to put it on them and be like, you are the one who is making this decision. That way, if it does but come back to bite the group in the ass, you can just point to the producer and be like, I told him I gave him everything. I laid it all out. He's the one who said yes. Take his head, not mine. <laughs> I heard that expressed as, if you want it bad, you're going to get it bad. Yes. <laughs> Can you describe your ideal testing department? My ideal testing department, um, I mean. Good pay. Yes, good pay. Um, I would honestly say I had it for quite a while at Wargaming. Um, we had a good group of people who knew what they were doing. We could swap projects as needed. The devs were great. Uh, Heather was one of them. Um, really communicative. Uh, every, meetings were productive. And for the most part, QA got what they needed. And for the most part, the producers listened. But again, when we put it back on them, like, hey, if you want to do this, <coughs> you have to be the one who signs off on it. We tended to get our point across. So, and resources, I would say, 
Oh, I am so sorry. Excuse me. Um, because you want to use something that's good, especially for automation. So as someone who is, has been playing around with N unit and X unit, uh, which are C sharp uh, automation frameworks after playing around in PyTest, say PyTest does it so much better. And it's it me that I have to use N unit and X unit, but you know, listen to them, give them the tools they need, uh, the tools they want, you know, and yeah. Okay, cool, thanks. Uh, real quick note on the phrases thing. One, one, one I like to use is just like, uh, uh, like think slow, act fast, or you gotta go slow to move fast kind of thing. Um, but that's a little catcher. Uh, my, my question is, um, so sometimes with, with uh, when, when we add these layers of like uh, uh, staging, dev, prod environment, that kind of thing, um, we're adding complexity. So to, to get a change into production, uh, you got to go like you get the benefit of extra QA and like catching it before it gets production, but it, it sometimes does slow things down. So I guess how do you think of like when is the the in the extreme case of like committing directly to prod? Just be more careful. Reverse your <laughs> if something goes wrong, you can quickly reverse it. Maybe that only works on a solo dev, small team kind of thing. Um, I don't even know in a small team. I, I guess what, what are, when are cases where you think um, it can go like overboard? Like, uh, overboard is in like we're taking too long or you went too fast uh, when, when you'd probably want to be a little less uh, less test heavy and, and I'm, I'm saying that carefully because like I, I, I still think generally it is one of those moves so kind of I would things, think like that would be a hot fit hot ugh, hot fix situation where it's like you release something and it's like, oh, things are now broken. Or in the case of um, when we worked at Wargaming, often <coughs> we need to update the web services to go along with the game version. So we would have <coughs> time, but sometimes things came in at the last second. Again, it comes down to prioritizing what, what was touched and basing your test plan off that. So if it's like, if, you know, just Count invoicing was touched, focus your testing on that. If it's something like you, you kind of want to have a good idea. And this is where QA being like this being their job will, should have a good idea of like, okay, this is what's important. If this, this is what needs to be tested. If this gets changed, this is how I would prioritize those tests. And if I did have to like cut some, this is what I would cut. And then, you know, based on time. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, I think that's a good example. Okay. Um, I think you up front had a question? Yes. Uh, do you have a blog or do you have any recommended resources? Um, do you have any recommended resources for people who want to learn more? Because I feel like this was like a really good introduction and it was very. Um, um, convincing, but I feel like there's so much more. To it um honestly i've just kind of been looking stuff up it, it all depends on what you want to go into and you kind of have to be careful especially now that um qa as a service is a bigger thing because they're just like you don't need to think about that we'll think about that for you and it's like no i want to think about it for myself and so you kind of have to do some digging i don't really have anything personally but i can definitely look like when i get home tonight and like post anything up on uh, the chippy slack if I come across anything good. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, do you see any like uh, worthwhile or ideal testing teams where the testers are involved in writing like code, maybe not like um, test level, but at the integration or, or end to end test level? Yeah, I think that's valid. It's a step above unit tests. So the reason I recommend devs do unit tests is again, is it something they can use locally? And then also as they're writing new features, they're the ones updating it. So the test should be updated to work with that. Whereas QA automation, that may not necessarily get a chance to be updated until QA has their hands on the changes and then they can go like, okay, you know, we need to update, you know, this function to now handle this, or you know, this function is no longer needed. We need to take it out. 
So I do believe there's value in that, but there also is still unit tests. You know, there's a reason they should be written. Uh, yeah. Uh, my question is like, so you mentioned, a few, I think an earlier example where like coming into a team with like no tests or no infrastructure, because um, sometimes, yeah, you want to get started on a project, but there is no like staging environment or staging database or something like that to work with. So like, how do you approach those situations of like, can you even get started or like, because sometimes you can't really block the project from starting necessarily because the infrastructure is out there or maybe that's out of scope. So um, I guess, are there any common patterns you've seen as far as like incrementally getting um, thankfully, yeah. I've the places I've worked have had some sort of either what I was working on was standalone or they at least had one development environment outside of production, like protected from production that could be tested against. Um, if you don't have that, I would strongly make the case to your team or the project or whoever would have control over that because that's something you should have it you should be able to get it off of your machine and put it somewhere else in a test environment so you that acts as a step to help you make sure that you wrote everything down correctly you remembered everything you did correctly and yeah you you really want those if you don't have them uh any other questions Oh. Actually, I did. Okay. Oh, this is, is going to be the last question. <laughs> we will be meeting at the bar afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm I'm curious because from my personal point of view, uh, QA is almost a little bit behind as like a manual team. From my understanding with most modern software engineering teams, you have with infrastructure as code tools and stuff like that, you have basically like performance software engineers, DevOps software engineers, building on full on frameworks, testing every single permutation of inputs for a program before going into production and that and not just testing like if it works or not, but also testing performance, memory usage, CPU usage, uh, all that kind of stuff. And I'm just curious how you QA, I don't even see it as a separate field, but it's almost like nowadays with modern DevOps and performance and infrastructure software engineers, it's almost a field of software engineering than just separate. I could see that, yeah, because I mean, essentially what I am is an SDET. I am a software engineer that focuses in testing. Some places use the the terms interchangeably, like I've worked for places that where I was called a QA engineer, but I was essentially an SDET in all but name. So you are right, a lot of QA who have coding skills are essentially software developers who, who um, whose focus is in testing. Uh, does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah.